It's the Jim Fannin Show. We've come to take your mind. Am I still on? Gordon McGill is my guest. He's a trucker. He's writing for his Newsweek lately, getting picked up by Fox News. He's going to talk about the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. Buckle in. It's the Jim Fannin Show. Welcome aboard. Good morning. <laughs> ah, the guest is running over my intro, Gord. How are you, man? Thanks for taking the time. I know you're really busy. Uh, how are you feeling, man, first off? Um, it's been an interesting few weeks. I, uh, I've kind of stuck my neck out here. Uh, I'm literally nobody, but, uh, I've used some, uh, small podcast and media connections to my advantage in attempting to defend my, uh, my fellow road warriors up North. And it's kind of turned into a snowball thing here. That's kind of got out of my control. All right, introduce yourself to the audience since we don't know you that well. Tell us all about where you started and how you got here. Take as long as you need. All right. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Gord McGill, uh, born in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, grew up not far from where Jim used to broadcast from, uh, a little place called Beamsville in between the Hammer and St. Catharines. Uh, played a lot of football in St. Catharines when I was on the BDSS uh, football team. <coughs> um, been in the trucking business most of my life. My dad was a trucker. My grandpa was a trucker. Both my uncles were truckers. Um, I worked for a company in Stony Creek, uh, hauling steel kind of all over the place. And then uh, various other stuff, heavy equipment, sort of a little bit of everything. Uh did a lot of traveling when I was younger. I went to New Zealand, drove logging trucks in New Zealand. I've been to Australia a few times, drove road trains in Australia. Um, did four seasons up on the ice in the Northwest Territories. Uh, spent a lot of time in Alberta hauling fuel in the bush, uh, working seasonally. Um, kind of done a little bit of everything as far as trucking goes. And uh, um, I'm now married to an American lady and I live in upstate New York, got two little kids and, um, I'm still driving. I haul propane now. Awesome. How did you get linked with the freedom convoy and what made you get active in it? Well, I, I, I let's, let's be uh, full disclosure. I don't have any official ties to the freedom convoy. I'm just sort of a fellow traveler and supporter. Um, I've been following their development sort of like everybody else online uh, for, for a few weeks. And I decided um, when they came to Ottawa that I would go up and, you know, welcome them into town with everybody else on the overpasses, you know, waving flags and signs and, you know, can't, you know, being a Canadian that wants an end to the COVID regime. And I thought, you know, the least I could do <coughs> given my uh, 25 years in the business and, uh, you know, just being a regular old Canadian person, the least I could do was go up there and express solidarity uh, with them and for them. And I spent the weekend in Ottawa and then uh, came home and saw the media doing what the media does and started writing back against it. And how did you get picked up by the mainstream media? And if I can say that Newsweek and Fox is mainstream from that respect, I mean, and Newsweek certainly has done a more objective shift. Uh, they've lately been very left-wing, but lately 
Uh, recently, anyways, uh, Andy No is writing for them, and then they picked you up for two articles that were really well written. I couldn't get through your articles, man. I was too, uh, the rage was setting in too much. I couldn't get through it because it's just, a, <laughs> it just uh, reinforces my anger already. So, how'd you get picked up by the big boys? Like, Fox? Um, so I've I've sort of like been commenting on trucking related issues for a few years now. Um, Started really small, but probably, I guess when I decided to start writing was when the Americans brought in the ELD mandate back in 2017-18. I uh, wrote this little blog post for uh, a little tiny uh, libertarian blog here in the U.S. And then um, I, I started experimenting with Twitter. Like, I used to be on Facebook and I canned my Facebook account in like 2016 or 17 when Trump came along because everybody lost their minds. And I had just decided that my participation and everybody else's brain lint had kind of run its useful course. So somewhere along the way in 2018 or 2019, I thought I would start experimenting with Twitter just because that's where like media people are. And, you know, being a trucker, I'm also a podcast junkie. So I listen to tons of podcasts and audiobooks. And I thought, you know, why not? Why not connect with some of these people and see see what they have to say? And um, there's a a, a, a a political social commentary uh, interview podcast called What's Left. It's hosted by this guy in Pittsburgh named Oliver Bateman, and he has a sidekick who is this crazy Australian lady named Amy Terrace. And I say that kindly; it's not a diss. She's just she's just terminally online. And she's a Marxist and she drives, she drives the sort of democratic media types in America insane. But anyway, Oliver had me on his show to discuss the trucking business because he started this series called the work of, which is where he was interviewing like working class people to see what they had to say. And, um, Oliver had me on his show and uh, about a month later I got kicked off of Twitter. Um, which was very coincidental. And I'm not sure if the reason I got removed from Twitter was because like so many people uh, had a bone to pick with his co-host who wasn't even actually on the show. It was just me and Oliver. She wasn't available. And, um, and, and I, or, or if the people that tried to get me that, that had me kicked off Twitter were people in the trucking industry who saw what I was saying because like it was a pretty extensive show. It was about an hour and a half and we went deep and I showed, you know, scholarly research and uh, lots of investigative journalism that kind of showed a lot of the problems in the trucking industry stem from the corporate welfare aspect of it. Insofar as the trucking business receives a lot of grants, subsidies and direct payments from the government to train drivers, which sort of, allows that churn to go on. Everyone says, oh, we always need truck drivers. Well, they never ask why a whole bunch of them quit all the time and how trucking companies are able to like maintain this um, high turnover rate. And it's because of government subsidy. They're literally being paid for by the taxpayer. So anyway, I exposed all of this. Um, apparently that podcast was a big hit. I mean, you know, I, I think it's been viewed or downloaded somewhere around 50,000 times by now which whatever compared to Joe Rogan or somebody like yourself, it's probably not very much, but like for, for, for an industry specific show, it was a bit of a hit. And um, so anyway, I uh, was kicked off Twitter. I stayed off Twitter for a while. And then um, I got in, I've maintained contact with this writer named Steve Shelley, who's a professor at Penn state university. And he was, the, he's the guy that wrote this one book. So I went back on Twitter I did all of the tech things, right? I got a new VPN. I got a new SIM card. I did all the stuff to evade the robots. And then I sort of re-engaged my sort of sideline of commenting on the trucking industry. And um, I did another show with this Oliver Bateman guy. I've done a few other ones. I've, I've written an article for American Conservative. I wrote an essay for this uh, DC-based think tank um, called, called American Compass. Uh, that essay was put together in a part of a package that was um, given to every member of Congress. So yours truly here has uh, had his writings seen by the highest halls of power in the United States government. I'm actually... And then um, the trucking convoy came along and uh, so the, the people at Newsweek were looking for um, 
uh, so somebody to comment on it. And one of the Newsweek people knows Oliver Bateman, the host of this show called What's Left, and got a hold of me and said, would you like to contribute something? And I wrote an article and they loved it. And then uh, about a week later after it came out at Newsweek, uh, it ended up at Fox News and Laura Ingraham saw the article and really liked it and had her people track me down. Um, so I appeared on Fox News on Friday that just went by. I didn't ask them, they asked me. I have no I have no intentions or delusions of ever trying to like break into the mainstream media. This all just kind of happened by accident because of my like little sideline of discussing trucking industry stuff that ran head on into the Freedom Convoy in the last couple of weeks. And um, boy, oh boy, did that Fox News thing get me in trouble with a bunch of people. Um, one of my oldest friends texted me this past Sunday morning and basically disowned me. Um, didn't read the Newsweek article, didn't care to discuss the merits of any of my arguments or any of the facts about anything. She just said, I don't know you and don't ever fucking contact me again. So that was interesting. Um, all of my in-laws who are sort of super progressive types, they've, they've had some questions and I've had to you know, explain myself to people, which is so weird. Like all I did was accept the offer to use someone else's megaphone to defend my people. I'm trying to stand up for the truth of the matter and the righteousness of the cause of my fellow truck drivers who are literally fighting for bodily sovereignty, something that you know, the left used to be highly interested in, but they've abandoned because of COVID mania. And yeah, I, I get it that Laura Ingram's a very controversial figure and Fox News isn't everyone's cup of tea. But like, if I have the opportunity to defend my people in front of millions of others, if only for four minutes on this crazy woman's Fox show, it was hard for me to turn down. And I mean, they literally emailed me at lunchtime and said, can you be on at 3 p.m. for taping? And like, you know, I, 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 I guess three hours is lots of time to think about that. But <laughs> I, I sort of jumped at the chance, you know, because, you know, the, the, the media have been lying through their teeth about my, my fellow truckers and this protest. And look what that lying has led to. Trudeau just basically declared... They, he invoked this emergency act yesterday and in Canada is more or less under martial law now. And all of it is based on the media's delusions about what's actually happening in Ottawa and their blatant lies. Anybody that's there can tell you it, but like if you're at the CBC or, you know, left-wing media in Canada, they just keep saying like, Oh, Ottawa is under siege, even though there's been no violence. Um, what arrests the city of Ottawa has undertaken have been from people like failing to provide identification. It's basically been a party in Ottawa every weekend since the uh, protest rolled into town. There's been like ravers, a guy who organizes the biggest Psytrance festival in Canada played for six hours there two Saturday nights ago. More and more people keep coming down and like of all walks of life, the videos are all out there. You know, and the media ran with this guy with a swastika flag who is literally a plant. Like, there's a video of him being accosted by other protesters. He's wearing a balaclava. He's wearing police issue boots. He won't talk. He won't identify himself. He's one guy. He wasn't part of any other group. And he was ran off by the protesters. But Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau keep saying swastika, 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 and dismissing us and saying we're all violent right wing fringe extremists. And it's total horseshit, and I'm not going to stand for it. Tell me a little bit about the effects of cancel culture on you, your job, and your family. How does it hit you? Well, I mean, like I say, I'm nobody, and I'm sort of impervious to it in a, prof a professional sense. Like, you know, I I'm in the middle of transitioning out of this one job anyway, and my boss is up over his head with bit the, the height of home heating season, and he doesn't care. He doesn't even know about my online activities. Like he really couldn't care less. And um, I'm going to work for another company soon here anyway. And that guy could care even less. He, he doesn't even have a smartphone. He's still using a flip phone. He doesn't have an email address. Like he's old school. So like, as far as like my ability to make money, it's made no difference, but it's seriously like made my relationships with people a little weird. Like, you know, my oldest best friend who I've known since I was four years old was at my fifth birthday party, spoke at my wedding, 
you know, like just basically told me to get lost and get out of her life. Um, and I've, my phone hasn't stopped ringing for like five days. You know, I can't, I can't not, I can't stop trying to explain to people because everyone is so triggered by Fox news. Like people who are like on the left or don't like Fox can't wrap their heads around why I would have accepted that invitation. And like, I keep saying to people, I don't care about Fox news. I don't watch Fox news. I don't watch most mainstream media because as far as I'm concerned, they're all liars or misinformation peddlers of one description or another or narrative pushing pimps. So like, it, it doesn't matter to me. And, and the funny part is, is like, I've never been contacted by the CBC or CTV or any media in Canada, except you, you know, you're the only person in the Canadian wow. media other than one podcast uh, based in Ottawa. That's like also affiliated with the UK. Um, you know, you understand how the Canadian media normally works, right? Like if, uh, if, if a person does really well somewhere else in the world and, you know, becomes a thing or a star or does well, the Canadian media is usually all over it and they want to they wanna pump that person up and, and, and talk to them. But the Canadian media who've probably all seen my Newsweek article, like I, when it came out, I would post it on under CBC Twitter stuff or CTV stuff and say like, you guys are lying and you're peddling misinformation and you're smearing my truck drivers. So people in the Canadian media have seen my Newsweek piece and not a single one of them has contacted me to ask about it or anything like radio silence. So yeah, if Fox news is the only uh, TV show, mainstream media, whatever, that got a hold of me, like who am I to turn down that offer to borrow their megaphone for a few minutes? And what is your hope that uh, speaking out is going to do for uh, your, what you call your people, the truckers? Well, obviously, the, the, the whole situation up north has been so crazy and chaotic. Um, I don't know that... I'm going to have any effect on Trudeau or the government. I mean, whatever. I'm just one guy screaming at the internet. Uh, however, you know, every person who I can persuade that they're being lied to by the media, that the story is much more nuanced and detailed uh, than is being presented, then that's a win. If I, if you know, the, the, how's the old saying go? Like if I can win hearts and minds over and stop having people believe in this nonsensical bifurcated polarized media landscape and understand what's really going on then i could i consider that a success you got any predictions on what might happen now that they've invoked the war measures act well the emergencies act which replaces the war measures act which was brought in by justin's father pierre elliott trudeau any predictions on whether we're going to see violence or tanks rolling or how this thing's all going to play out. And, and I, I mean, all he's got to do I'm, is... I'm not very good at predicting things. I'm not much of a political forecaster. You know, I'm, I'm just a family for a living. Uh, it's very interesting that the first thing that Trudeau and his uh, deputy prime minister and finance minister, Christia Freeland announced in the wake of the emergencies act being invoked is these new measures to allow the banks to freeze people's accounts that, you know, who are, they claim are financing terrorism, which is just a load of shit. Anybody who tries to give money to the truckers, to these legitimate peaceful protesters are being targeted by the state. Like, this is some banana republic, Soviet era, like, you know, oh, you're an enemy of the state now, and we are going to basically freeze and steal your assets. This It's got nothing to do with safety. It's got nothing to do with, you know, the supposed violence of which there is zero evidence going on in Ottawa. All the bridges were cleared. Like, Doug Ford declared the Ontario State of Emergency Friday. A, a small handful of arrests were made in Windsor on Sunday morning. Everybody left peacefully, no violence. Everyone got out of the way. Trade resumed on the bridges. Okay, Doug Ford. Okay, Justin. You got your uh, you got your bridges back. The only people left protesting are a couple of other border crossings out west and in Ottawa. So what what is this emergency? There is no emergency. This is laughable and absurd on its face. This is allowing Trudeau 
to target his political enemies and punish them and, and literally rob people. That's what this is. This has got nothing to do with any emergency. This is a naked political power grab and everybody can see it. How this plays out for Trudeau as far as politics goes, I mean, it makes him look really bad. Um, the Toronto Star came out and attacked him and said, you know, this, this, this is invoking the Emergencies Act is the wrong thing to do and it's an admission of failure on his part in handling this. So, I mean, when you've lost the biggest left-wing newspaper in the country, you know, I, I, I don't think that bodes very well for his political fortunes. And also, no one in the government seems to be talking about infections anymore. Nobody's talking about COVID. All they're talking about is the safety of the public and getting our lives back. All we want is our lives back, and that's what the protest is all about, to cancel the mandates. So what are your thoughts on the fact that none of our political leaders are actually talking about COVID infections anymore? Well, because COVID's over and they know it, they just can't come out and say it, right? Like, man, infections are down, cases are down. There was an article, I can't remember if it was CBC or CTV News or maybe the Ottawa Citizen, that COVID infections and COVID hospitalizations in Ottawa as of this past Saturday, after two weeks of all these dirty, unvaccinated truck drivers were laying siege to their city, were the COVID hospitalizations were at the lowest since the beginning of the pandemic. Doug Ford's announcement yesterday, he said, you know, infections are way down, hospitalizations are way down. You know, there's no reason to carry on with the, the, these mandates. So you, you've seen a number of provinces drop their, drop their mandates. A number of health ministers in other provinces are talking about how they're going to do it. You know, COVID's over. Like, we're done with this. Everybody's over it, and we're done. Yet, you know, you, like you said, they're they're not talking about it. They're talking about all this safety nonsense because it's, it's a thought-terminating cliche. There's a whole problem, like, throughout the rest of Western culture right now with safetyism, which is this idea that, like, safety at all costs, you know, people not allowing to make their own risk assessments about anything as individuals anymore, Um and, and the invocation of it is just another one of these thought terminating cliches that's supposed to get you to not think for yourself and believe whatever the government tells you. Right. And um, like you say, it's, it, it's not about COVID anymore. It's about uh, using every last excuse to carry on the power they granted themselves during this pandemic, even though the pandemic is over. Power and control, power and control, and follow the money. You know, we arrested all the therapeutics in favor of a vaccine. And I'm not going to say anything that's going to get me terminated from my YouTube here, but we had some therapeutics that were working well if you got it in the first three days before replication. And all they did was demonize them and make them unavailable in favor of the shot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to get into arguing about therapeutics versus vaccines or whatnot. Uh, I, I, I'm here to defend truckers. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of telling that they only focused on this one thing rather than, you know, there's this guy named Brett Weinstein who said, you know, like if, if this pandemic, this emergency, if this problem is as bad as they say it is, why don't they approach it like a war and throw everything in the kitchen sink at it? Instead of using every tool available to help, They've concentrated on only one, and any suggestion of using any of those other tools is met with open hostility, censorship, being thrown off the internet, canceled, whatever you want to call it, which has been very, very interesting and ridiculous. But, you know, it, it's over, and, and they don't want to give up these tools they've given themselves. You know, like, the, like you said, power and follow the money. And one of the, one of the things I want to say to people that, there, there, there's one, one of the lies the media has said about the truckers or certain corners of the media. I don't want to say all of them, but certain leftoid commentators that don't know what the hell they're talking about have, have, have invoked that, you know, millionaires and billionaires are funneling their money to the, this freedom convoy. Well, I'm, I'm going to disassemble that argument. If millionaires and billionaires are funneling their money to, to the convoy, I think they would do it directly because millionaires and billionaires have that kind of power. Why would they go through GoFundMe, who literally robbed the convoy and turned around and gave all the money back to the donors? Why would they go through this other little company called Give, Send, Go, who 
Ford has tried to freeze their access to Ontario banks. The feds are investigating them. They got hacked on Sunday. There's, there's media outlets like letting out the names of donors to try and shame people. Like that's a pretty ineffective way of sending money. And the millionaires and billionaires have already said their piece, right? So there's this organization in Canada called the Canadian Trucking Alliance, which is basically a lobby group. Many in the media said they were a union that represents drivers when it's the opposite. They're a lobby group that represents the owners of very large trucking companies. So the Canadian Trucking Alliance from the beginning has supported the mandates, fully supported Trudeau, attacked the Freedom Convoy, denounced us in public, very publicly. So the actual millionaires and billionaires who are involved in the trucking industry, who donate money to Trudeau's campaign, the CTA has given money to the Liberal Party for years, those millionaires and billionaires are against us. So anytime anyone says to you, oh, the convoy is a right-wing grift operation and they're secretly financed by billionaires, is a fucking idiot and a mewling cabbage that hasn't been paying attention to the facts. It's totally opposite what they're saying. Pardon the swearing, but I'm very, I feel very strongly about this smear. That's okay. You don't have to uh, protect your enthusiasm, and I appreciate it, man. I thank you for everything that you've done already and continue to do. Uh, what do you think your support is among most truckers? How many guys are behind this? And have you taken the shot? I have not, no. Um, I mean, my dad did. My dad crosses the border. He still works for the same company I used to work for in Ontario there at Stony Creek. He took his shots, you know, whatever. Um, he did say, though, that he won't be taking any boosters. Like he said, if, if boosters become mandatory to cross the border, he'll just quit. Um uh, a, a few of my comrades that were in Ottawa um, had not taken the shot. Some had, you know, a lot of the people who are supporting the Freedom Convoy have been very explicit. Like, yeah, we took our vaccination, but it shouldn't be mandated. People should have the choice. That's the official message of the convoy from the beginning. We are against the mandates across the board, provincial, federal. We want all the mandates scrapped and we go home. That's it. There's no other, there's no other agenda. There's no other secret. We want to become the political power or we want to replace Trudeau. We're not joining the Conservative Party. There's never been any other mission, you know, and, and it's been suggested to me by some people. Well, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau is bad, but I really wouldn't want this guy who runs Canadian Unity or whatever this organization is or Tamara Lich to become a politician. None of these people have said they want to join politics. None of them. They've said very, very clearly. And the mandates, we go home, we go back to our lives, it's over. So this, this, this idea that people in the convoy want to enter politics or like take on power, is, it's absurd on its face. And the people have been very clear that they don't want to do that. I got a buddy of mine that uh, crossed the Canadian border into the U.S. January 3rd, and he didn't even have to show vaccine papers. He said, I'm going to Florida for a few weeks. Did you get a hard time at the border? And how did you get in to Canada if they won't let you in without a vax? Um, so they have to let you in. If you're a Canadian citizen, you are allowed to go back to Canada under any circumstances. Same if you're an American. That's the whole point of citizenship, right? What they do, and this was part of the, the vaccine mandate was if you defied it and came back into Canada in a big truck at the border without a vaccine card or a QR code, um, they would basically force you into 14 days of quarantine, which, you know, you can't, you know, do a trip to Ohio from Ontario, which takes a day or a day and a half, two days tops, and then come back home and then have to be forced into quarantine for two weeks. It's ridiculous. So, you know, and like I went back to Ottawa, I'm not vaccinated. I got COVID in January. Uh, I shouldn't say January, just right after Christmas. Um, my wife, who's fully vaccinated and boosted, went to go visit her relatives in Pittsburgh who are all fully vaccinated and boosted, every single one of them, and COVID ripped through them. And my wife brought it home to me. I had a 100-degree fever for two days, felt kind of tired for three days after that, so maybe five days in total of effect. And I went, but you know... Didn't, you know, I, I'm a healthy, young-ish guy, I guess. <laughs> wow. And uh, my children got it. You know, my children are too young to be vaccinated. 
and they had minor little fevers and we all slept a lot and it passed through us and went away. You know, we stayed at home, we isolated, we did what we were supposed to do. What did you take for it? Anything? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, the only, the only thing I've been doing in preparation for this, I mean, like I, I have some friends in the, you know, nat- naturopath and health world. And, you know, I've been listening to their advice for years. Every winter I take lots of vitamin D3. I supplement with zinc, uh, quercetin. Um, you know, I eat a healthy diet. My wife's a vegetarian. Um, we, we eat pretty healthy here. And, you know, get your sleep, get your exercise. I work outside. I deliver propane. I'm in and out of the truck all day. So I make a point of getting enough sunshine. So, like, there's all these ways that you can look after your health, which, interestingly, you know, you brought up um, preventatives and uh, and other treatments. One of the things missing in the narrative uh, going through all of this has been people looking after their own health and being allowed to make their own health choices. And, and the government... And the health authorities have done nothing to tell people or to encourage people to look after their own health. Hey, guys, everybody, you should go take D3. Everybody, stop eating so much. Obesity is one of the number one comorbidities. Stop eating this garbage food. Get more exercise. Do whatever you have to do to make yourself healthy. There's been none of that from the public health authorities whatsoever. Just stay home, watch your Netflix, order your food in and take your vaccine. It's mind boggling how anybody who's in any authority over health got away with this. Well, I appreciate everything you're doing, man. I know you're busy and thanks for taking the time out. Uh, A final word to anyone that might be watching or listening on the rebroadcast or live right now on uh, your thoughts moving forward and what they can do to help. Well, um, I mean, the usual stuff, write your member of parliament and say you don't approve of this invocation of the emergency act. Um, be, be critical, use your noggin, you know, understand that the media uh, are narrative pushing lying shit bags at the best of times. And it doesn't matter what quarter of the media, it doesn't matter left, right, center. The, the, the media is the media. They're subsidized by Trudeau. And they're not here to tell you the truth and you have to go and dig for it yourself. And you have to find people like me that are actually what, you know, what's the, what's the phrase subject matter experts and, and find out what's really going on. Keep an open mind and remember principle, you know, you, people have a right to bodily sovereignty. You know, you have that right. And we're not going to just give it up because we've been living in fear of this silly virus for the last two years. And we're not going to give it up because of, authoritarian tyrants like Justin Trudeau spinning lies in order to consolidate and further his own power. Like, don't take any shit from any of these people. That's my advice. Thank you, brother. Nice job. And you, uh, you hit on something I've been talking about for two years and I haven't changed my tune for two years. I've been talking about the same things we've been talking about. And, you know, one thing that gets lost in this whole narrative is uh, the lack of the promotion of personal responsibility. Take care of yourself. You know, and, you know, I'm in the, used to be in the hemp food business. You know, essential fatty acids are the best things you can do for your immune system and your immune response system. More importantly than how strong your immune system is, your immune response system is important because as soon as the bug hits you, you need something that acts fast. And that's why some of these therapeutics are good. But nobody's talking about taking your EFAs or, vitamin D, C, and zinc in preparation for this or getting your exercise and getting sunlight and stuff like that. Personal responsibility has just gone out the window completely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's terrible. And if you do, the, the problem there too is, is that if you, if you do take your own personal responsibility and that personal responsibility doesn't include what the government tells you, then people view you with suspicion. It's all very odd. All right, my brother, I really appreciate your time. Give my best to the family and the kids, and I hope you're well. And, uh, man, continue writing those. Admit, you're no dummy. You know what I mean? You are well-spoken. You're well-researched. You're writing multiple essays for Newsweek and the American Conservative and stuff like that. I'm not suggesting that anybody's a dummy, but, I mean, you come across really well, so you're a good spokesperson for the cause, man. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you for your kind words, sir, and um, cheers for having me on. I'll I'll take any opportunity to 
defend my fellow truckers and, you know, basically the, the, the prime rights of my fellow Canadians. Thanks very much. You're welcome, brother. Have a great day. Thanks for the time. Yeah, cheers. Again. Appreciate it. All right. It's Gordon McGill, everyone, if you need them. <coughs> uh, the links are in the show description, no matter where you're seeing this. Here is, uh, well, the, here, here are the links. So as I do a hard cut on my uh, guest, Gord, I didn't say goodbye to him or anything. Here's uh, one of the Newsweek articles here. Uh, elites are smearing truckers because they're doing their job representing the people. An opinion piece for Newsweek. And Newsweek, as I said, has become a little bit more um, objective these days, if I can say that. Um, why are Canada's unions siding with the government against workers? That's his latest piece with Newsweek. The good old boys is on Patreon. You can visit Gord there. The American conservative lighten the trucker's load. And here's another one here. This one's on the post. Why I took part in Ottawa's Freedom Convoy. I am Jim Fannin. Coming up at 1 p.m. EST is Maxime Bernier. Maxime Bernier is the leader of the People's Party of Canada. And he's another guy that does not change his tune. He's not interested in which way the wind blows, what the polls are saying. He's principled. He's strong. And he's been standing for freedom all along, including his exit from the Conservative Party of Canada. 1 o'clock p.m. today EST Max Bernier Mad Max on the Jim Fannin show peace love hug your neighbor and whatever you do rip that mask off your beautiful face I'm out